Good evening, companions. I hope everyone is staying healthy. I would like to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Mike Ramos. Mike is past master of Crow Canyon Lodge 551 and Templum Rosé 863. He is also past high priest of Simonov Daylight Chapter 163, inspector of District 15, current uh, illustrious master of sword and trial council 65. So thank you for joining us tonight, Mike. It's a, really an honor having you and excellent companion. The floor is yours. Excellent companion, Stevens. Thank you so much for such a kind introduction, and thank you, companions, for um, hosting me this evening. It truly is my pleasure to be here with you. Um, wonderful introduction as well. Thank you so kindly. Um, so uh, tonight, I'm actually going to be debuting this presentation with you. I was actually requested by Grand Chapter to put this together, and I'll explain why in a bit. But um, this presentation is about English Royal Arch Masonry, where sometimes I think in any jurisdiction, any Mason starts, I think, to, to believe that what they do is universal the world over, when that's really far from the truth. And even though Masonry came to the United States through primarily military lodges attached to the Ancients Grand Lodge, which were kind of a mixed bag of Englishmen, Irishmen, and Scotsmen. Um, the Royal Arch that we ended up inheriting is different than what is currently and has been worked in England for quite some time. And I'll kind of get to some of those differences here. And um, over my shoulder, this is actually um, the, uh, the shield, the, the standard for um, my Royal Arch chapter. Um, in England, Schubert's chapter. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and see if I can share my screen and get my presentation going with my deck. Can everybody see my uh, my screen? Yes. Yep. Great. Okay. So, companions, the name of my presentation is the Holy Royal Arch in England: An Alternative Perspective for California Companions. And right here, this image is actually. Um, the two tracing boards, which are utilized uh, in this degree, um, more or less as purely ornament, because there is not a tracing board lecture in the English Royal Arch, such as you find in the craft degrees and in other various orders in England, they lecture while the candidate views the board. These are much more um, artistic niceties, which would be placed or not placed within the chapter room. Okay, sorry, it seems like I have a little bit of a lag here. Um, but anyways, so typically, I, I, I actually uh, present a lot to English brothers and English companions. Um, so typically during this portion, I have to explain, well, why do you want to bother listening to me? And then I give them some background on what I've done in the States, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason why Grand Chapter wanted me to formulate this is actually from the masonry that I have going on over in England. So I'm actually an English Mason and a California Mason. Um, I helped found a new lodge in England, Essex Cornerstone Lodge, number 9,968. And I also am in the process currently of helping form um, Essex Cornerstone Royal Arch Chapter. And um, I'm a member of a lodge that meets at Freemasons Hall in London, as well as another uh, Royal Arch Chapter there. And I am actually um, uh, entering uh, the Rose Croix, which is the English, um, the ancient and accepted rite for England, which is different than what happens in the Southern and in today's Northern Masonic jurisdiction. Um, the ancient and accepted rite in England is actually a Christian body and it um, is a bit more chivalric and focus a bit different. So today, what I hope to do with this presentation is be able to explain a bit about some of the differences and some of the beauties of English Royal Arch Masonry. And I'll start with a small segment from one of the three lectures. It shows the Royal Arch to be the climax of Freemasonry and is intimately blended with all that is nearest and dearest to us in a future state of existence. Divine and human affairs are interwoven so awfully and minutely in all its disquisitions. It has virtue for its aim, the glory of God for its object, and the eternal welfare of man is considered in every part, point, and letter of its ineffable mysteries. This is a portion of one of the three lectures, as I said, from the mystical lecture as worked in the domatic 
ritual working of the royal arch. And these right here are platonic solids. These are actually found in the chapter room during the degree. And an explanation is given to each one of these pertaining to the elements and the ether, because the lecture actually parts of this lecture specifically um, fall into much more spiritually esoteric concepts around deity. So the way that my presentation is put together is through a few different sections. One, we're going to start off with a very brief history of the Royal Arch in England. Um, some notes around how it is currently governed, current statistics, the workings of an English chapter, American verse English chapter composition, some unique aspects, some ideas around culture and customs, regalia, charity, what's going on for the future, and a conclusion, and then some Q&A if you find this of interest and have some questions. Okay. So a brief history of the Royal Arch in England. The first hints of something akin to the Royal Arch starts to appear in the 1730s. Now, as I said, the version of the Royal Arch that we ended up inheriting is slightly different than the one that is currently worked in England. And it's even different to another version that was floating around at the same time. So needless to say, you had this Scotch master degree or Scots master degree, which dealt in either a, a vault legend, which is something we can all relate to here, the Royal Arch, or it dealt in the travels of Zerubbabel, which if you're a Knight Mason or a member of the Scottish Rite, um, you can uh, understand that as well. However, one of the versions of the early Royal Arch was Christian in nature. If you are a member of the Red Cross of Constantine, I'm sure you can think of the appendant orders and what that would mirror. There's a version which is much more what has worked in England today, which we'll talk about more. And then the version that we inherited, which is um, a bit different. People typically say, oh, our ritual is Irish. That's not true because the Irish Royal Arch ritual does not even take place in the same time period, nor are the same objects recovered. So during this time period in the 1730s, we start seeing a degree being developed either along shoulder and shoulder with Matt the Master Mason or slightly afterwards. From the 1740s, Royal Arch Lodges, because there was no term for chapter yet, worked an early version of the degree. Several variations are known to have existed and have developed differently. From the 1750s, craft lodges under ancient warrants. So this is under the Ancients Grand Lodge, which was founded in the early 1750s, around 1751. Um, they worked the Royal Arch along with the chair degree, which um, is uh, something akin to the virtual past master, but uh, slightly different. They worked these um, throughout the British Empire, including in colonial America. And some of the earliest Royal Arch ceremonies to have taken place that are recorded, written down, actually come from the American colonies. Um, a little bit of clarity too on how an ancient Grand Lodge warrant worked. Beyond the three craft degrees, a chair ceremony for the master of a lodge and the Royal Arch, they said, well, if you have enough brothers in your lodge that know a degree that um, you would like to bestow on the members of your lodge, as long as you can work it, feel free. They believed that a warrant stood for all the degrees of masonry. So the premier Grand Lodge, which was the one founded in 1717 or more likely 1721 or 23, um, they did not recognize any degree beyond that of Master Mason. Initially, they only recognized the Entered Apprentice and Fellowcraft. That's all that was in existence. And once the Master Mason was officially adopted and was being worked by their Grand Lodge at that time and eventually by what were called Master's Lodges. Um, they still would not recognize the Royal Arch or anything else beyond that. Um, however, as time moved on, some of their most senior members were being exalted as Royal Arch companions within Royal Arch Lodges. Um, so <laughs> they had to reconcile this somehow. So their good idea was, well, what we'll do is that we'll form the premier grand chapter. So they formed this in 1766. And so the joke was they formed a grand chapter, a grand body to govern a degree which they officially didn't recognize. However, the reason why they did this was because they were trying to cut the ancients off at the knees and basically say, well, even though you work this degree and now we kind of do, we don't recognize your work. And there's something interesting 
about that to this day with the Supreme Grand Chapter of England, because albeit we as American Royal Archmasons or anyone in a regular jurisdiction could visit a chapter in England, to this day, the Supreme Grand Chapter does not officially recognize any other Grand Chapter. What it does is that it says, well, if you're a Royal Arch Companion in a jurisdiction where your Grand Lodge is recognized by the United Grand Lodge of England, we accept your work. So it's actually kind of tongue in cheek that to this day, they only recognize themselves. So moving on from that, companions associated with the rival ancient Grand Lodge, who didn't believe they needed to form any other grand body, because like I said, they felt their warrant entitled those to work any degree they wanted. However, um, they formed a grand chapter much more just on paper. They, in fact, were calling it... Um, a committee or a union, and they did this in 1774, albeit it was really just a name, and the ancient Grand Lodge still governed that degree. And this document here is actually called the Charter of Compact. This document here is what the Premier Grand Lodge drew up to legitimize their Premier Grand Chapter. So the feud between these two grand bodies continued, these two grand lodges, it continued, but the um, feud was uh, put to an end in 1813 when the Articles of Union informing the United Grand Lodge of England occurred as part of that act of union. The Royal Arch was recognized and included within what was considered pure ancient craft masonry. In 1821, the restyling of the premier grand chapter to supreme grand chapter. So the, that first grand chapter that was formed by the premier grand lodge companions, um, what they basically did was they just restyled the name and absorbed those ancient masons and brought them into a union together. And at that point is when they actually officially said, okay, the Royal Arch degree, even though we're saying in the Act of Union, we're going to consider it part of ancient craft masonry, it can no longer be worked in any lodges. It has to be worked in Royal Arch chapters. In 1823, the standing prerequisite in needing to be a past master, or at least having been installed in the chair and entrusted with the secrets of the chair, was removed. And so membership flourished within the Royal Arch. So genuinely, at uh, the beginning, you had to be a past master in order to become exalted in the Royal Arch. However, what they did was that they realized there's sort of a loophole. They're like, well, no one says how long you have to be master for. So what they would do was, is that these things called master's lodges, after the regular craft lodges started working the third degree officially, it went from the Grand Lodge only working it to master's lodges working it to all the craft lodges. So the master's lodges didn't have much to do they started actually um, opening up and then would install numerous brethren into the chair, give them the secrets, and they were master for probably five minutes, two to three minutes, but that's what they needed in order to then shovel them off into a Royal Arch Lodge or a Royal Arch Chapter. So um, the relationship and governance between the craft and the chapter remains very, very, very strong to this day. It's very, it's a very interwoven structure. Both are headquartered out of Freemasons Hall of Great Queen Street. Uh, the Book of Constitutions for the United Grand Lodge of England contains both the rules for the craft as well as the rules for the chapter. Um, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Kent, serves as both the Grand Master and the First Grand Principal. The Grand Secretary, Dr. David Staples, for an example, serves not just as the Grand Secretary, but also as the Grand Scribe. And we'll go into some title differences, but um, in English, Royal Arch Masonry, there is no secretary. He, uh, the secretary is called Scribe Ezra. Um, and this cross-governmental custom that we witness here at the Grand Lodge and Supreme Grand Chapter level uh, additionally flows down to the Program Master. So the Program Master is also the Pro First Grand Principal. And we see this exact mirrored structure all the way down to the Metropolitan, Provincial, and District levels when it comes to governance within the two bodies. Present governance today in England, the Supreme Grand Chapter obviously is the head, established in 1766, as I said, and restyled in 1821. So from there, it goes down to how the Grand Lodge and Grand Chapter of England are set up. Um, the Supreme Grand Chapter overlooks the 
metropolitan grand chapter. There's only one of these, and it is in London. There are 47 provincial grand chapters. There are 32 district grand chapters, so that would be overseas. And there's seven groups. So a group would be so small that it does not warrant to be even a district grand chapter. And they oversee what are called private chapters. I'll get into that terminology a little bit later. And there are seven private chapters which are so remote that they report directly to Supreme Grand Chapter with absolutely no middle management interference. So present governance, each governing body that I was explaining there, whether it be provincial, metropolitan, district, or group, they have great autonomy regarding how they choose to rule and administer their affairs. Um, they're really treated with respect. This structure has been around for quite a long time. So there's some rules that are absolutely mandated and you have to follow, but there's a great deal of leniency to allow these organizations, these bodies to govern their private chapters or lodges in a manner that suits their geography, the culture of the membership, et cetera. So chapters, same as lodges in any unit in England, they're, they're considered private and not subordinate. So that alters a great deal the relationship between the rulers and the unit. So uh, it, it alters the relationship between the body and the grand body, because this goes back to the days when they had to basically bribe lodges to join a grand lodge. They didn't want it at first. They, there was a lot of reason, especially the more provincial lodges, they didn't, they didn't want to be ruled by a grand lodge out of London that was set up to govern London and Westminster originally. So with that, the units themselves have a lot of freedom with how they conduct their own business. Um, additionally, and this will be of interest to California Masons, within English Masonic structure, so that's the entire structure, there is no grand representative set up to oversee with the intention of intervening in the private affairs of individual units, i.e. ritual working, proficiency, officer qualifications, administrative procedures and policies, et cetera. So they have some they have some grand representatives called inspectors, but they don't do what our inspectors do. In uh, an English lodge, English chapter, whatever, if somebody said, no, don't hold your you know, rod like this, hold it like this, you'd, you'd ask them to leave. It would be considered rude to intervene and tell them what you perceive as the correct way of doing things. Um, the uh, grand appointments, so the way that their grand rank works is that if a companion is going to be recognized for his good work, um, the first grand appointment he would receive is a past grand rank at the provincial, district, or metropolitan level, dependent on where he's stationed. This is an honor in name and investment only. So he's not an active grand officer. He will be invested. He will have new regalia, which he wears for the rest of his life. The title carries with him the rest of his life, and it only alters when he has been promoted upwards and obtained a different past or active grand rank that then takes the place of that one. So as I was saying, you start off with a past grand rank, you receive new regalia, you're invested. It's a title, it's an honor. From there, later down the road, you might be promoted to a higher past grand rank. So a higher title. So you might go from assistant director of ceremonies up to, uh, you know, provincial senior grand deacon or something to that effect, but it's still inactive. Um, or you might receive an active provincial metropolitan or district grand rank. And then finally, you might receive a past or active supreme grand chapter rank, et cetera. That goes with lodges as well. Um, there are no elections. That's not a part of the English grand system. All positions are appointed by the authorities, by the rulers, and um, uh, they're, they're, they're determined through that hierarchical structure. So there is no um, putting yourself up for grandmaster. That, uh, that, would not, uh, that would not happen. So current statistics, um, there are 105,000 companions under the Supreme Grand Chapter. So that's 55% of UGLE's membership are also Royal Arch Companions. Um, in California, I can tell you that it's 5% of Master Masons are Royal Arch Companions. There are 3,000 chapters under the Supreme Grand Chapter. Uh, the Royal Arch is the most popular of the progressive orders, followed by the Order of Mark Master Masons. The average age of a companion is 60. The average chapter is made up of 35 companions, and the chapter normally convenes no more than three or four times per year. 
the workings of an English chapter. So the only degree worked within an English chapter is the Holy Royal Arch. That's it. Uh, the Mark is governed by the Grand Lodge of Mark Master Masons in Mark Lodges. The um, virtual past master does not exist. That is a chair degree for real masters of craft lodges that they receive on their first time going into the chair and a board of installed masters. And the most excellent master degree is worked actually in a Royal and Select Masters Council over there. So various rituals are utilized by chapters. What I mean by various rituals is it's the Royal Arch, but it's a different ritual form. <clears throat> Um, usually not deviating much from each other, but there can be some differences. Um, the most common is called domatic. The second is called alders gate. And the last most popular is called perfect. Sometimes a chapter will even blend aspects of multiple rituals into its workings. And this, you know, stems from <clears throat> ultimately an English Masonic body is going to do what's right for itself, not what's right for an individual who isn't a member. So, so it's very, very much member centric culture custom centric and it's a little hard to tell a lodge like the lodge of antiquity that's been around um since the formation of the grand lodge like for an example that they're going to do something different that they've been doing for 300 years or um saint james's chapter that's been around for over 200 years to tell them they're going to do something different doesn't really work like that so each of the three principal officers of a chapter receive their own specific chair degree so each one of them receives their own specific ceremony, which um, imparts additional secrets and significance to the degree itself and their office in particular. Unlike in um, American Royal Arch workings, the passing of the veils, um, that's removed. The only region really that works that now is in Bristol. And Bristol is a, a really interesting area for Freemasonry. If any of you are interested, look up the, the Rite of Baldwin or the Baldwin Rite. Um, very, very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, so the veil ceremony was removed during the 1800s um, and uh, Bristol brought it back. But um, there are sometimes um, uh, demonstrations of the veil workings and they call it the degree of excellent master which those of you here that are allied masonic degree masons will know that we even in america maintain the veil workings in amd as the excellent master degree so um kind of interesting there um yeah so anyhow i will go ahead and move on oh and just for clarity too there is no york right in england they don't know what a York Rite is. Um, that's purely an American invention. Um, I consider it a marketing campaign that got out of control in the late 1700s. There's no anticipation that because you complete the craft journey in the Royal Arch that you want to go on and become a knight. There's no, that does not exist. In fact, that would be um, really odd over there to consider it. If you want to do other things beyond lodge and chapter, um, you certainly should, and, and you would, but it would not be an expectation that because you've become a Royal Arch Companion, that you're going to join Royal and Select Masters or Knights Templar, et cetera, et cetera. So the composition of an American chapter versus an English chapter is very different. To the right here, I have an image, <clears throat> a um, floor diagram of how the chapter room should be set up. So you can tell this by looking at it, that it's very, very different. But um, as we look at the officers, the principles are in a different order. In England, uh, Zerubbabel is, um, is the first principle. He is the, albeit they stress the importance that this is a triune leadership that governs as a council, so equal authority. However, Zerubbabel is, for all intents and purposes, the head. Um, for us, it is uh, Jeshua. Um, and you can see that um, Haggai and uh, Zerubbabel are switched around uh, compared to ours. And what I think is really interesting, when you talk to some American Royal Arch Masons that do uh, some research, they, vary, they are very much proud of the fact that Jeshua was ultimately <laughs> rearranged as the first principal in our Royal Arch. Um, however, I question this because even when we open a chapter, we, we remember it's dedicated to Zerubbabel. So I, I think there's just some things that we altered um, as you find in a lot of American ritual, any mention to us uh, in some bodies 
at a certain point removed mention of sovereigns and kings, not at all. But um, I think that it was probably something done uh, at a time period where they literally made an innovation for the sake of not having a, a, a king officer over top of them. But as you go down the list, obviously they don't work the veil, so they don't have veil masters. Um, the first assistant sojourner and the second assist, assistant sojourner uh, take the place lightly of some of the work that a captain of the host or um, royal arch captain might do. But ultimately, you can see over here by the diagram that it, it is terribly different. And on my very first visit to an English royal arch chapter, I was asked to help with the degree. And I told them, I said, this is so different than what I'm used to that I can't fake it. I said, I can't fake this at all. And they basically said, okay, well, um, you're, you're just going to do X, Y, and Z, and it'll be very easy. So I stood up and did. But um, I got to tell you, it is uh, very, very different. Um, there is uh, not a lot that is, uh, that is similar. And as you can see right here in this photo, this gives you the image of a chapter room. This is what a chapter room looks like. No one walks on this centerpiece. In fact, symbolically, as you can tell, even by the black and white um, checkered floor here on the Royal Arch mat, it starts getting kind of a weird distortion. Well, that's intentional because it's supposed to give you this illusion of looking down into a vault. So some of this stuff symbolically is not even supposed to be on the same level of the floor as you. Um, the, uh, the degree itself takes about one hour. Uh, as I said, the order of the principles is different. Most excellent Zerubbabel is the head, um, Haggai, then Jeshua. Um, the, the, the triune authority of these three is really emphasized in their ritual. And they are referred to as the council or the grand Sanhedrin. <clears throat> Three candidates are not required. One candidate is normal. That is what you want from them because the principal sojourner and the first assistant actually take the place of the two others. You don't need three companions to experience the degree. These other companions are the sojourners that sojourn with the companion then experience this with him. Um, uh, the sojourn itself is mentioned, but it does not occur. So that big, long, winding walk, none of that happens. You show up, you take the obligation in a similar manner to what we do. And then when they come back in, it starts from the point of, in essence, being there to meet the principles and be put to work, et cetera. Um, the primary focus of this degree of these workings is between the interactions of the candidate and the principles the vault experience, the recovery of the lost master's word, the sacred and mysterious name, and the lectures which occur. There are three lectures attached to these to this degree in England. One is called the historical, one is called the symbolical, and the other is called the mystical. Um, I will make those lectures available um, probably next week for any companion that would like to read them. I, I. Um, I find them to be questionably the richest lectures I've read yet in Freemasonry, and I'm a very active Mason, and um, they're just absolutely beautiful. It gives so much more light to the power of the Royal Arch. So I will be making those available um, for anyone that would like to uh, have a copy. Um, what is recovered? So part of the big difference here is that there is no, there's no copy of the orc, uh, the items within it, except one, or th that has nothing to do with the degree. Um, what is found when the companion goes down into the vault is um, a scroll copy of the Book of the Law, which we can relate to that, that is sitting on a golden plate containing a triangle, and in the circle of this golden plate is the ineffable name. This is on top of a white marble double cube altar that you can see there in the floor. Um, on this altar are the initials of the names of the three grand masters. Normally in Latin, this altar, and this picture has it in um, Hebrew, um, and uh, the carving of a triple tower. So unique aspects, the compound word used to aid in deciphering the sacred and mysterious name. I'm not going to say what that is. We all know what that compound word is by taking those three other words. Uh, eating with the vowels, um, that process of this degree was actually removed in the mid 20th century due to, um, th there was an inquiry by some angry anti-Masons, um, some very anti-Masonic individuals um, involving the Church of England that created an inquiry into this situation. And they just, 
uh, ended up removing it because there was so much bad information out there that it promoted the worship of a pagan deity um, that they ended up um, removing it because it caused such a stir that they didn't view it as being necessary. They knew that other places were not using it. So they removed that portion altogether. Um, so there is no needing to decipher. It is more of an understanding of what is being witnessed and then backed up by the principles that yes, that is the aim, et cetera. The only the principal officers communicate the sacred and mysterious name. Um, so the whole chapter does not get up and then raise an arch together, et cetera. This is done by the principals. And in some chapters, they do this privately um, before the chapter is open because they actually perceive this as something very special between the principal officers that should not be shared with everyone in the room. Um, English Mark Master Masons and Royal Arch Companions can visit an American chapter and attend either of those degrees which they previously possessed, but must be healed in the virtual past master if they are not a past master of a craft lodge and or in the most excellent master if they have not received this within a council of royal and select masters. Um, and they must do this in order to join an American chapter or visit an American chapter, um, but it's a very painless procedure. I've actually witnessed it happen and it is quite easy. Most chapters in England, in fact, it is irregular to not see this, but most are from their inception sponsored by a craft lodge that they will be attached to. So the lodge says, yes, we support this chapter forming. They will receive their candidates from us. This will be a happy marriage. Um, and usually the chapter will take the same name and potentially the same number. Um, this, I think, will in the future become more normal. I'll explain why, but my lodge, Templum Rosé 863, is already looking into this, um, probably for in the next two to three years to form our own Royal Arts chapter, which will be attached directly to the lodge. So the brothers can be companions together as well and complete the ancient craft Masonic cycle together. So some things around culture and customs, which this pretty much spans across a lot of English Freemasonry. Um, as with all English Freemasonry, the festive boards, the toasts and fire are an integral part of the Masonic experience. Um, one of the big differences is that festive boards are very formal. The, um, it's toastless driven, protocol driven. It is not just sitting around and eating and then calling it a festive board. It very much is a program. And they put just as much work into the dining experience of Freemasonry as they do into the ritual and um, fraternal side um, of, of that, uh, of our beloved institution. Um, formality and protocol are followed and expected to be understood and appreciated. Um, the giving of alms is anticipated. It is compulsory at every, every Masonic meeting um, and uh, being of a charitable disposition is expected um, at every Masonic uh, dining, you, you will find that there is a raffle at the festive board at some point and um, be prepared to donate towards a festival, which is ultimately a, a large charity um, appeal um, that the province or metropolitan area you're in is uh, collecting for. Usually it's a five-year program. Um, the English Royal Arts chapter is the home of very serious ritualists and those who appreciate the deeper aspects of Freemasonry. Um, those actively engaged in chapter are more likely to be active within the other progressive orders. Um, however, uh, many English Masons limit their Masonic life to simply the lodge and chapter. Um, this is sort of something that goes back a long time <laughs> due to um, arguments over, well, what does masonry consist of? And there's still people that say, well, um, it really only consists of the lodge and chapter and anything else is just something that you do. Um, so there are a lot of people that limit their Masonic life to those two bodies. So let's go into the regalia. So on the left-hand side, this is the regalia of just a companion, a member, or a lower level officer. On the right is the regalia of an excellent companion. So uh, a principal or a past principal. And to explain this regalia a bit, I, I took a snippet from the uh, symbolical lecture of domatic working. The ribbon worn by the companions is a sacred emblem denoting light being composed of two of the principal colors with which the veils of the temple and tabernacle were interwoven. The sacredness of the emblem is further signified by its, ir by its irradiated form, which has ever been considered an emblem of regal dignity and power. 
Here are the breast jewels of the order. So the white ribbon is for companions. The red ribbon is for excellent companions. MEZ is uh, most excellent is rubbable. And this would be, uh, it's not mandatory, but some chapters will buy this jewel for um, the outgoing head. Um, it's very much like a past master's jewel. And the one to the far right is uh, for grand rank. Additionally, um, the sojourners wear this long white vestment. Um, with their uh, ribbon over top, an apron, et cetera, and a collar and a jewel. So I laid out the collar there, and that jewel is actually uh, Zerubbabel's jewel, but they have jewels for all the officers. To the right are the robes of the principals, which mirror quite, uh, quite certainly what we would do in the United States. The colors are of no difference. And here are the scepters. So these are, they do not use gavels or malls in an English Royal Arch chapter. So the three principles have these scepters. This is what they knock with. They knock on the ground. There's a series of how it happens, who does what and when. And um, these scepters are actually quite impressive. Um, my Royal Arch chapter at the home uses a set of scepters as well instead of uh, gavels. However, our scepters are not as beautiful as these. This is an image of three companions. Um, late 1800s um, in uh, the uh, Royal Arch Regalia. Wanted to show you an image of uh, days gone by. This here is a photograph <clears throat> of a set of principal officers regalia. And it is, uh, as far as I'm aware, still to this day, the oldest remaining set of Royal Arch principal regalia. And this is coming from around the 1760s. And this is a photograph of what it actually looks like. I mean, I'm not gonna lie to you, it looks hideous in the photograph and I'm sure it's been beaten up by the sun and wear and tear, et cetera. But this is what was worn, something akin to this during the 1760s. And this here is a photo of a modern Royal Arch English chapter right here. Um, <clears throat> a good friend of mine uh, in, in the back, um, uh, actually kind of dead center in the black suit in the back row, um, Elliot Shevin, he's actually the um, provincial deputy grand superintendent for the province of Essex, and he's a founder member of Columbia Historic Lodge here in uh, California as well. So charity, this is a huge aspect of English Freemasonry, but definitely to the Royal Arch. Um, every companion is expected to support his um, local festivals and appeals um, regarding uh, he would donate typically to wherever his uh, lodge chapter etc is stationed under what grand body the provincial district or metropolitan and he's and expected to give directly support to his community um, by giving of his time and talents um, the masonic charitable foundation is uh, something that was created about i think 10 years ago 12 years ago where they took a certain amount of charities that were all sponsored by masons and put them under one umbrella so um under the issue of the royal masonic benevolent institute teddy's for loving care which is a really cool charity that i donate to and it actually is for when children go into the emergency room or go into hospital um masons make sure that there's a teddy bear there for them which is theirs and they get to keep it something to keep them comfortable during a scary time um relief uh, relief chest schemes um and uh charity grants um there's also a number of other masonic charities that uh, there's too many to list but, but some specific ones that i um that either one of my bodies is involved with is uh, saint john's ambulance Great Ormond Street Hospital, London Fire Brigade, Air Ambulance, Blood Bikes, Life Lights Children's Hospice, the uh, National Lifeboat Institute, and the Hamilton Court Housing. So what's happening there for the future? Um, <clears throat> and this actually is uh, a logo for the chapter that I'm helping found over there now. And I had we had our, uh, our first big founders meeting earlier today um, on Zoom. So the Holy Royal Arch continues to grow in popularity with young and newer members. They are not lacking in members in the Royal Arch. Um, what's good for the craft is good for the chapter. So ultimately, um, uh, there's a lot of good things happening. And we'll get to that uh, on the next slide, but a lot of good things happening with English Freemasonry becoming more open and um, using a lot of different avenues to uh, promote their good works uh, publicly. And this ultimately rolls right into the chapter because they're so, um, they're so locked at the hip. Um, unique opportunities for membership development and engagement equals better retention. This follows directly, not just in the lodge, but in the chapter. Um, it, in fact, it poses a very unique aspect uh, for membership development and engagement because it's offering 
um, it's offering a, an additional chance to share in each other's company, but also in what is considered the supreme degree, in essence, of the craft journey together, um, which ultimately, um, when it comes to masonry, hopefully we can say you can't have too much of a good thing. Um, so uh, a lot of promoting Royal Arts through open houses, information nights at Masonic centers, lodge partnerships, and across the progressive orders, which would be the terminology of what we might call a pendant and concordant. Um, as younger Masons become more interested in a traditional Masonic journey, um, and perhaps more in Masonic education and research, um, this provides the chapter immediate notice and prominence, because obviously it comes up immediately as you start talking about uh, a more traditional Masonic journey in uh, kind of the days of old. Um, there's a lot of cross exchange of different ideas across our small Masonic world. A lot of cross exchange through jurisdictions that recognize each other and that's one uh, out of this horrible pandemic all the sad things terrible tragic things that have happened one ray of light has been that a lot of masons um, have and jurisdictions as a whole have been able to come together to, to learn from each other and talk and and, and uh, promote future project ideas etc um, and as freemasonry becomes more public um, its members become more educated and comfortable in discussing the broader tapestry of the craft um, and this ultimately lends itself not just to the lodge, but the orders beyond it, such as the Royal Arch. So some of the things they're doing, obviously, very, very active in all the social media platforms on Zoom. Um, a lot of young Masons clubs or light blue clubs that are actually promoting bonding younger Masons together um, at a younger uh, point in their Masonic journey, because ultimately they might be able to connect and um, work well together as they travel through this journey, even if they're not in the same lodge or chapter. A lot of strength on the YouTube, um, uh, YouTube media with educational videos and promo regarding their charity, as I'm sure a lot of you have seen. Um, Inside the Freemasons, just an incredible, incredible documentary that um, was broken down into five episodes. Um, it's available on Netflix here in the United States. If you have not watched it, I recommend watching it. Um, they're definitely getting very active in podcasts, um, online education, the Masonic Museum, um, and the member, Members Pathway is something that aids in the education of younger candidates. But one thing that I find terribly interesting is no matter what Masonic Center you go into in England, maybe minus Freemasons Hall, there are ads on the literally posters framed promoting, well, you're a master Mason, so what's next? It's promoting and reminding brothers of the relationship between the Royal Arch, between the chapter and between the lodge. So in conclusion, um, regardless of jurisdictional differences, the spirit and purpose of the Holy Royal Arch is universal. Um, as younger, newer members seek a more traditional Masonic experience, the chapter becomes the next ideal regular step in their Masonic journey. Um, it's a strong touch point for membership engagement and retention. Um, and it certainly is a place where younger members and seasoned members alike can experience um, the deepest ancient craft symbolism and the, the very root of, uh, of, of the meaning of masonry uh, together um, while building upon that fellowship that has been carried over from the craft lodge. And with that, that is the conclusion of my presentation. So I really appreciate you letting me present. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I do have one. So in regards to what uh, one of the parts that you spoke about is that our, they do require charitable giving. Either it is by your time or your money, correct? Now, with that being said, how is that enforced? It's not enforced. It's just expected. So expected. It's, it's not enforced. So um, <clears throat> every Masonic body, generally speaking, has an almoner or something equivalent to it. And so the almoner makes his rounds during a lodge meeting where it's expected that you're going to drop something in the alms bag. That is actually more for the widow's a widow is in need or if a brother becomes ill it's more for direct aid to somebody involved in the lodge or a member of their family however it is certainly expected that you're going to be charitable um, with your time but um, also uh, where you can with your pocketbook as well but it is not enforced there's no one saying show me your receipts or, or anything okay. yeah uh, that the reason i say that is because i've encountered some lodges 
yeah, you know, letting them know that this is for the CLC, this is for whatever, this is for really established charities mm -hmm. and still the brethren will not do anything. Mm -hmm. so, but I'm not saying across the board, I'm just saying. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 my lodge, just as an idea, so my lodge created the position of almoner and um, after our degrees, when you say to a brother, you may be seated among the brethren, and they take their seat, um, especially in the EA degree, and they go take that seat in the northeast corner. The next thing that they witness before we pick up with what is ritual is that they witness the almoner be called upon to collect for, to be collect for, uh, you know, for the good of charity. So it's the first thing they witness after the degree is done. So it's something that we did to start instilling that in our EAs. And we don't demand anything, but it's just something so that they witness that that's part of our culture as Masons. You give and do whatever you do, you know, in the manner you see fit. Um, but it is something that, you know, I, I think that we, you know, we consider near and dear to our practices as far as our, you know, um, our beliefs and our philanthropy. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, excellent companion. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, back in November of 2019, uh, when the world was normal before COVID, mm -hmm. I was fortunate to uh, travel to the uh, Grand Lodge of England and mm -hmm. had a great time. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two part question, if I may. First yeah. question is, how do you go about visiting a Royal Arts chapter uh, in England? I know what I did to visit a, a stated meeting over over there uh, back in 2019, but I don't know how to go about it uh, to visit a Royal Arts chapter. That's the first question. Yeah, so you would just, um, what, what you would do is that you would um, uh, talk to uh, Phil Hardiman <laughs> and you would get him to, to write you a, a letter of standing and I would recommend getting one from your secretary because like nobody cares about dues cards, <laughs> but here, like nobody cares about a little piece of paper. Like they want a letter stating that you are in good standing. Like they don't, like that doesn't mean anything to them. You know, like a dues card. So um, get yourself letters stating that you are in good standing. I would recommend from the grand secretary as well as the secretary of your chapter. And then um, I would reach directly out to Supreme Grand Chapter and then just say, hey, I'm interested here's my documentation and then give them Phil's um, contact information. And then ultimately they will have the grand, somebody from the, the grand scribe's office probably make contact with him, just solidify it. And, and also they might say to you, well, which one do you want to visit? Because they might expect that you already know where you want to go. Um, so you would want to make it known to during your communications where you're going to be and what you're, you know, what you're hoping to see when you go. And then they're generally pretty good about helping place you and introduce you to um, at least, you know, three chapters. And then you could find out who's meeting when. One good thing about English Masonry too is there's actually, to be, to be honest, there's no such thing as a stated meeting in the way that we understand it. There, um, the only time there would be a meeting without a degree being worked or without an installation being worked is sadly if the body was not doing well and didn't have a degree to work because like my lodges, they only meet four times a year. When I mean they only meet four times a year, that's it. So they initiate, they pass, they raise, they install. Um, so you really should never run the risk of not being able to see something pr pretty good, you know, because you'll always probably be there for some form of a degree. And my second question is, what do you account for their success rate in uh, having Master Masons move on and pursue other degrees versus what's going on in say California? Hmm. Um, well, I, I, I think it's, um, you know, masonry, I guess I'll back it up by saying this. Masonry, you know, sees, sees some pretty universal issues. Um, you know, like they would say, oh, we don't have as many members as we used to. Oh, you know, things aren't the way they used to be. Well, we hear that song and dance everywhere. Um, but the truth of it is, is that I think that um, ultimately the difference is, even though that it is the oldest of the Grand Bodies, even the Grand Lodge of Scotland, the Grand Lodge of Ireland, which are terribly old as well, 
they adjusted with the times and kind of made things livable <laughs> for, for their members as things move forward. And I think that part of it is that sometimes to be a Mason in California, it's like taking on a second job. And every single time you join something else, it's like taking on another job if you want to be an officer. There, they meet infrequently because they understand that their members have other things going on in their lives beyond that. And they practice, they, they, they have lodges of instruction, they practice, you know, some, some lodges meet once a week, it just depends. But really, I think it's because there's not so much time being demanded. So it's easier to partake and want to be there when they meet, because it doesn't feel like, oh, I have to show up for a business meeting, which I could care less about, just a business meeting, but I'm mandated to do it. Um, every time they do something, there's a reason why they're meeting. There's a degree, there's something going on, there's a festive board, there's good food, et cetera. So I think part of it is just the way that they have dealt with moving forward. And they've made it so that um, there's uh, less stuff that is unengaged, <laughs> that, that would uh, disengage its membership being involved with down at the lodge and chapter level. They make it very much so that they can focus on masonry and not a lot of the other stuff that I think in other jurisdictions across the world, um, they ended up getting themselves involved with. For example, no lodge owns a property or you know, like there's none of that kind of stuff. They just rent space at a Masonic center, at Freemasons Hall, et cetera. So their prime focus is Freemasonry, fellowship, enjoying each other's um, company and festive boards. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that's what I saw when I was out there. I was, I was fortunate that I, uh, I was at, uh, I forget the name of the lodge, uh, but they uh, balloted a candidate, they initiated him, and they installed their officers in a span of two hours. Yeah. Then they went to dinner, and mm -hmm. uh, because they rented space at Freemasons Hall, and, yeah. and they told me they start their meetings at 3.30, they're done at 5.30, they go in to have dinner, because they have uh, Masons who live outside of London who need to take a train. The yep. ones who don't will stay a little bit later, and you know they'll, they'll have a couple of drinks, but it was just boom, boom, boom. It was very well organized. They still had, uh, they're still teasing and joking. It was, it was just done very well. It was very organized. And, and so that's why I wanted to maybe next time I go out, you know, visit a, a Royal Arch uh, you know, chapter. So thank I you. Would, I, I would seriously recommend it. I, I, I would, um, I, I certainly would recommend it um, that you, that you definitely do that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hey, Mike, I have uh, two questions for you. One, just a very simple question. When you landed on that um, charitable uh, causes slide, mm. I see often uh, the jewels in the English traditions have that word steward on there. If you can explain that really quickly. And then the second one uh, was um, in your, uh, your Essex um, Royal Arch ch chapter, uh, you know, I've visited you guys virtually a few times and, you know, I love the camaraderie there. Uh, what do you see as your personal experience in the culture of that particular chapter compared to how you feel over at Simonoff, Simonoff Daylight Chapter or whatever chapter you've been to here in America? Sure. Um, so just the terminology of the use of the word steward. So <clears throat> in... Um, regardless of the amount of different rituals that are out there just for like the craft. Um, they don't have stewards in a lodge that hold rods and, and do that kind of stuff. That doesn't, that doesn't exist. Um, in fact, I talked to Bob Cooper, who some of you might know, he's a great Scottish Masonic scholar, spoke with Rick Berman about this great depth. And I was like, like, do you know where this came from? Do you know anybody else that's doing this? And they're like, no, they're like, this is an American innovation. So the fact of having stewards in the lodge room that do that work, that doesn't exist. Um, that work is all handled between the Tyler and the senior, the senior deacon. Um, but um, so stewards in Masonic bodies in England, uh, they receive a jewel, right? And a collar. And uh, their job is actually making sure to leave the meeting about 15 to 20 minutes before it ends so they can get everybody's drink orders put in because their focus is on making sure that when the brothers come out, because they're the younger members, that they learn about how the festive board works, about when to pour wine, how wine is taken, how the toasts work, the formalities, the procedures, and also do a bit of the grunt work. But a charity steward is when you have donated to a certain extent that you have gained a recognition through that donation. So to be a charity steward, um, in the Essex Festival, it's 550 pounds, I think, uh, donation um, overall. Um, 
and uh, they, you know, as in a lot of things, Masonic, it's like, hey, you've done something. Here's a pen. Here's a jewel. You know, something to, to that effect. That that's universal. Um, but um, as far as what is my experience, like, let's just say in English, in English rural arts masonry versus what I do at Siminoff, they're very they're different worlds. Uh, they're just different worlds. Um, uh, English masonry is a lot more. How can I put it? It's a lot simpler to get involved with. It's a lot more clear cut. You know what you're doing year for year for year because you only meet a small handful of times. Um, you can be involved in multiple lodges or multiple chapters or whatever you, you kind of want to do, but, and it doesn't take up, it's not like taking on another job. It's not like, okay, now I need to like schedule out how my year looks based around this experience where I'm going to need to be out of the house X amount of times, uh, you know, uh, a month or a night. Now, Siminoff is different in the fact that we work quarterly. That's how we, that's how we work. And a lot of that comes from Edgar Fenham, uh, one of my, one of my mentors and a dear personal friend of mine, uh, you know, wanting to keep things simple he's an English Mason as well, keep things as simple as possible because he views it like we do less is more um, instead of more is more. And you know, that, that's just not true. Um, at least not for us. Um, so I would say that my experience is a bit more relaxed in England than it is um, overall in my American Masonic engagements. Great, any more questions? Quick one, uh, quick, just a quick one. Uh, what are the do's like in the chapter? Really depends, you know. Um, you know, mine is uh, 80 pounds per year. So that comes out to what, about $125 nowadays, $115 nowadays. Um, my lodge is about um, 225 US when you kind of do the, you know, the, the conversion. So, you know, not that far off. I think what the majority of, uh, well, the majority of newer lodges are, are doing, I mean, a little bit less actually. Thank you. Yep. Uh, it's interesting, Mike, that they don't, none of the, uh, the uh, lodges are owned, you know, by, they're all rented. So there's no hall association, there's no temple board, none of that stuff to, to spend time and money and an effort on. <laughs> yeah, it'd be very, it would be um, some lodges, I think, <clears throat> will have like an investment in a center, but it's not the same way that, you know, it, like they're not landlords. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not, it's not the same way. Um, in fact, to kind of go back to how they don't have stated meetings, the business of the lodge is dealt with very much on a committee level. The business that you would witness in a lodge after a degree, like our um, like our companion was talking about, is you know uh, reading of the minutes if they if they read them, because they can circulate their minutes. Um, if you need the ballot, um, report from the almoner, and then they do this thing called the rising. So you know how you know when we close lodge, we basically ask if there's anything for the benefit of masonry, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's three formal risings where you see like, I rise for the first time to ask, this is in almost all bodies. I rise for the first time to ask if there's anything for the benefit of masonry, et cetera, et cetera. Then that's lodge business or the body's business, the provincial grand's business and the grand's business. So typically it's just communications. So business is about 20 minutes, you know, about that. And their focus is on the degree on the dining, on the fellowship, and on that aspect of it, they're they're they have, they're uh, they're they're not business driven by by any means. Got it. I think we have one more question, Jim Baum. Hello, Jim. You're muted, Jim. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's been a long week. On the dues, does that include meals? It depends. So, with the, uh, so I guess I could talk about uh, terminology differences. So they don't call them dues because they call what we call per capita, they call dues. What we call dues, they call subs. So uh, subs is a subscription. So it depends. Most Masonic bodies will incorporate a dining fee into the subs, but you're, uh, there's two designations. You're either what's called a dining member 
or you're called a non-dining or what they call a country member. And that's just an old term from, oh, he lives way out far. He's not going to be able to attend dining. So we charge him a um, hundred pounds less a year. So if I was a dining member of my London Lodge, which I'm not a dining member, um, it would be closer to about 300 US. Um, that would include four, four meals, four, four course meals um, with dessert and the whole bit and like real food at a restaurant, right? And then um, uh, if you aren't, you're going to save a bit. But usually they want to know that up front because, um, you know, it, there's no show up randomly. That, like everything is dealt with RSVPs. It's dealt with early on. They circulate the meal um, because like my lodge, well, my lodge that meets in London, for an example, we meet at the Imperial after we, we have meetings. So we get the menu um, a month prior and then we have to designate what our meal is prior so that the restaurant knows what, what to serve us prior. We, it's not opening up a menu or picking the night of. Um, it's very, very well monitored. Those that meet at centers, there's no choice unless you're a vegetarian or you have health restrictions, then obviously you, you would let them know that, but otherwise it's a four course meal. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, so, uh, Mike, for joining us tonight. Uh, really appreciate it, it was, it was really good. It was really awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah.